After many years of promises, we're finally seeing electric versions of pickup trucks entering the market. These trucks are almost invariably similarly sized to the large pickup trucks that have dominated the US market for at least the last decade. Gone are the days of the Subaru Brat and the Chevy S10. Pickups across much of the world are now larger and more resource hungry. And with EV trucks largely adopting the same size and shape as their ICE brethren, from in the US, Ford's F-150 Lightning, to New Zealand's first EV pickup, the LDV EV T60, to meet the expectations of these truck users, they've also got less efficient. The most extreme example is obviously the Hummer EV, and folks have asked whether a vehicle that gets just 47 miles per gallon equivalent can truly be considered cleaner and greener. It's something which has been the subject of some discussion between members of the team in the office. But a recent study asks that very question. Can such gargantuan monuments to excess as the Hummer EV, the kind of things that cut through the air in just the way that bricks don't, be cleaner than their fossil fuel brethren? So let's take a closer look and find out. But before we do, I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, I'll tell you how you can sponsor a channel called Transport Evolved. Yeah, that, that doesn't really work. But what does is our coverage of news and reviews. So like, subscribe, and check out the end of the video where you can find out how you can help keep us independent and free from me doing poor quality raps. Okay, so the study titled, quote, the role of the pickup truck in electrification and the decarbonization of light duty vehicles, catchy that one, published in Environmental Research Letters, link in the description below, considers whether light duty pickup trucks can form part of the shift to cleaner transportation. Indeed, it goes further than that. The authors point out that the majority of studies examining whether EVs are cleaner have looked at sedans, or saloons for our non-US viewers, and so this study considered electrification of trucks, SUVs, and sedans. No motorbikes, though. And the first thing to note about this is it isn't a study based on numbers gathered from actual physical construction of physical vehicles. Unlike the Volvo study which we covered a while back, there's a link in the description, this study is based on theoretical values for construction of vehicles. These numbers have been calculated by Argonne National Laboratories in the United States. So the numbers in the study do come from a theoretical model, which may explain why the values given in this report for carbon dioxide emissions from production are markedly lower than, say, the ones we saw back in the Volvo study. To give you an idea, Volvo stated that producing an internal combustion engine or ICE XC40 produces around 16 tonnes of CO2. Producing the electric version, on the other hand, it believes produces about 25 and a half tonnes. The actual figures aren't listed in this new study, just a graph, and estimating off that suggests that their comparison is about 8 tonnes of carbon dioxide for a gasoline SUV and around 13 for a battery variant. Ok, so you might be wondering if this study is worth the bother of powering up your flyback transformer and getting your phosphors glowing. Yeah, alright, all no one uses cathode ray tubes anymore. But the point still stands, is this even a study worth reading? Well, while I am somewhat suspect of the absolute value of carbon dioxide production from building a vehicle in this study, the comparative value of 1.6 times as much carbon dioxide production when building an EV compared to producing a gasoline vehicle is pretty consistent with the values Volvo came up with. And that Volvo study remains one of the best studies I've seen. Ok, so what else differs? Well, this study does calculations based on rough battery capacities for four different electric vehicle ranges, 200, 300, and 400 miles, and also does some comparisons based on that, something that's obviously not applicable to the Volvo study. But then there are two other really big differences. One is that this study breaks down in-use emissions by county in the US, and then changes the highway stroke urban usage pattern to try and account for driving differences at a county by county level. Given that rural drivers may drive much further and be travelling between smaller urban areas, this is really significant and something to be aware of. And looking at some of the results in the study, it certainly impacts how and when battery vehicles become cleaner than their fossil fuel counterparts. And the other big thing, 
Well, this study attempts to estimate greening of the grid. That's important because gas vehicles will continue to pollute, but battery vehicles get cleaner as the grid gets cleaner. And that has a really significant impact on the results. So let's just briefly look back at the 2020 Volvo life cycle analysis. It's best break-even case. That's the point at which EVs become overall cleaner than gasoline vehicles is 29,000 miles or 47,000 kilometers. That's a direct comparison of building and running an XC40 ICE and an XC40 BEV. But to reach the best case, the EV is powered exclusively by renewable energy. This new study takes into account the fact that the grid is getting greener. It assumes a quote business as usual scenario with just the policies in place as of June 2020 as its baseline, although it offers alternate calculations for some different policy changes. That baseline produces a grid that is 50% less carbon intensive by 2035 than it was in 2005. The break-even point for EVs and ICE SUVs from this study calculation sits closer to around 20,000 miles or around 32,000 kilometers. Which is, well, I'd like to believe it. I'd like to have faith that the payback time for an EV is less than two years, but I suspect that Volvo's number is near a reality, at least until the grid really gets cleaner, manufacturing gets cleaner, and we get more recycled batteries and other recycled content. Circular economy for the win! However, that said, a very quick and dirty look at the two models suggests that the use phase emissions, that's the carbon dioxide released from petrol usage, from tyre replacement, from oil changes and other fluid replacement, is fairly comparable between the two studies for ICE vehicles. Which gives me more faith that despite the theoretical nature of the calculations, the comparison between vehicles within each study is okay. Which brings us to the whole point of this video. Having reached a point of saying, well, the comparison looks comparable to other studies that we think are correct, but the raw numbers might be a bit optimistic, we can look at the other results. And of course, you know what it says. EV pickups are cleaner than their ICE equivalents. The break-even in this study is about 20,000 miles. If anything, it actually looks a little earlier than SUVs. Presumably that's related to the atrocious efficiency of pickups. But even if the calculations are incredibly optimistic, even doubling that break-even is well under the average lifespan for a working vehicle. So yes, again we find that EVs are cleaner. But just because they work out cleaner in the end, does that mean we should be building behemoths like the Hummer EV? And that's a really difficult question to answer. The auto industry has spent the last few decades persuading people, against the actual facts, that SUVs are safer than traditional cars. Accident and injury statistics be damned, people think that bigger is always safer. And that goes doubly, maybe even triply, for pickups where the small and useful work truck has been largely replaced by something with little more carrying space in its pickup bed but a ride height that allows it to ford the upper congo without getting its occupants feet wet. While there are folks who definitely need that kind of vehicle, at least with our logistic systems being the way they are, there are also plenty who just want to pick up for something much less demanding. Lacking those options in the marketplace, these vehicles end up being a hinterland between the working vehicle and the leisure off-roader. While they can do both, the resources consumed for either job by these trucks are huge. Add in the expectation that they should have a 0-60 to 60 time that competes with sports cars, and we're into the territory marked Here Be Dragons on the map. But having sold a big chunk of the population on the concept that they need to have a vehicle that could double as a Jupiter Mining Corporation solar class ship at the same time as doing the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs, trying to persuade them that they'd be fine with something smaller rather than getting those incredibly polluting diesel vehicles off the road quickly and replacing them with electric pickups does seem like a fool's errand. And the delicious maths tells us that even if it's not ideal, it's a net carbon improvement. Of course, long term, replacing oversized pickups with more efficient uses of resources, that's definitely a good plan. But persuading many of those buyers that they'd be just 
dandy with a Kia Bongo 3 EV and they don't need their massive truck. That's going to take more than a hot minute. So maybe for the moment we just work on getting folks to consider something cleaner, whether it's a hybrid like the Ford Maverick Hybrid or fully battery electric like the LDV EV T60. We can hope that these electric and electrified trucks displace the diesel dinosaurs while we work on changing the conversation. At least now we know the maths works. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with more soon. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link below. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Zachary Courtney, Chris Center, and Denny Hyde, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylan, Matthew Drobnak, Joe Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Want your name in that list? You can join our Patreon at the link below. Support us using YouTube on the join button down there, or show us your love through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are lurking down in the description. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving.